Good afternoon, my name is Carl Harrington, and before I introduce Dr. Trian, who doesn't actually need an introduction, uh, for our first ever live broadcast of a presentation on IWF Ed Forum, I want to give you a little background about some other firsts in Philadelphia. Now there's a park over by the Delaware River that's got a bunch of plaques. It talks about firsts in Philadelphia. So Philadelphia was not only the first planned city in North America, and the site of the Declaration of Independence. It was also the first public library, the first hospital, the first railroad, the first mint, the first stock exchange, the first escalator, the first business school, the first fully air-conditioned air building, the first zoo, the first outdoor market, which is the Italian market, the oldest, uh, the first computer, the longest continue continually inhabited street in America, which you could go there and, while you're here. The first museum, the first art institute, institute, the first American flag, the first stamp, first locomotive, the first car, the first root beer, <laughs> the first mustard, the first free public school, the first volunteer fire company, the first US zoo, and about a zillion other things. But I bet you they're going to put a plaque up over there after this because it's going to be the first time the IWF had a live presentation any time in the world today, and that's going to go on that plaque. So it's my pleasure to introduce a man who does not need any introduction, but our deepest thanks, Dr. Steve Trion from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. Trion. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you so much, Carl, for that uh, very kind introduction. Before I get started, I too also want to acknowledge uh, the president and trustees of the IWMF, as well as the attentive and very caring staff of the IWMF. And if you're able, please uh, stand up and let's uh, give them a very loud round of applause. have an enormous uh, amount of debt that we owe these uh, individuals um, for all their hard work and uh, support of, of everything that helps make uh, all this progress possible. And uh, over the next uh, hour, we're going to be reviewing some of the important um, breakthroughs that have occurred. So the ones that I'm actually going to talk about are the ones that were reported at the International Waldenstrom's Workshop, uh, which occurred in New York City. That was last fall. Uh, this was an incredible meeting, and I have to thank uh, my colleague, uh, Chris Patterson, who served as a secretariat for the meeting. If Chris could please stand up and also be acknowledged for all his hard work. This was the 10th international workshop. We had 350 investigators representing 35 countries uh, that came to New York uh, to be able to present uh, their research. And uh, a lot was learned, and I'm going to be able to try to summarize all that uh, in less than an hour's time. You can see where the challenge is. But the second important meeting occurred uh, in New York, this time in April of this year. And this was the roadmap meeting that sponsored between the IWMF and the um, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Uh, this, too, was, a, I think, a very special meeting because it brought together uh, world experts this was a two-day summit where we had the opportunity to be able to get into the nitty-gritty of what had been discussed at the workshop. And through this meeting, to be able to develop a strategy that we hope would help us uh, get to the finish line. And so in the next hour, we're going to actually go through some of the questions that represent the priorities of our field and try to go a little bit through the research uh, that has been done and needs to be done to be able to get us those answers. Now, as you're going to see, we're going to do a deep dive here. And my hope is that uh, by the time we're done an hour from now, that we will all still be together. <laughs> you will have, obviously, the opportunity to ask uh, lots of questions once we're done. Uh, 
and so um, I, I'm, I'm very excited to be able to share uh, this information with you. So let's go through question number one. You see these questions, I think it really challenges all of us in this room, whether you're here as a patient, as a caregiver, uh, as a doctor, as a scientist, these are all the questions that should make us all think about where we are and where we need to go. So here is the first provocative question. Why are complete responses so uncommon in Waldenstrom's even with targeted therapy? And I just want you to reflect on this because to me this is probably the most fundamental of all questions, that if we really hope one day to cure this disease, and I'm certain we will, uh, first we have to get complete remissions because if we're not able to get folks there, really the endeavor of finding a cure becomes uh, a challenge. And just to frame this controversy uh, before I get into the data as to why this still remains an elusive objective, um, consider the debate that exists among our colleagues. That being, should we really be striving for complete remissions or should we be striving for control of disease? And this is a very important paradox because this means that the efforts, you know, that we're putting into uh, this disease, should they be focused on being able to annihilate every Waldenstrom cell that a patient has, or should they be focused on trying to control the disease? And there are a lot of variables that go into how one prioritizes uh, these two very important questions. So as I go through, I just want to show you First of all, why Waldenstrom's uh, has this um, challenge? First off, when you look at the bone marrow of a patient with Waldenstrom's, uh, be privy to the fact that it's not really one type of cell that we're going after. Uh, these are cells that are able to differentiate. They're able to morph. And as a result, the therapies that perhaps target one type of cell uh, don't necessarily target the other. And many of you are familiar with the term lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. After all, if you got a bone marrow biopsy, uh, that's what you're going to see. You're not going to see the word Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. You're going to see lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. This is what the World Health Organization definition is uh, of Waldenstrom's. And what that means is there's lymphocytes, much like the ones we see in lymphoma, but there's also plasma cells, much like we see in the disease multiple myeloma. And here we are now looking at this bone marrow biopsy, and you can see these cell types. Here's a B cell, this rounded cell right here that we see. This cell actually has CD20, and I think everybody in this room knows what CD20 is. This is the target of rituxan, right? And then you've got this intermediary cell called the lymphoplasmacytic cell, and it's one of those cells that actually has features of both a uh, B cell and a plasma cell, and it too also has CD20 on it, the target of rituxan. But now you go to the other cell that we see in the bone marrow, and that's the plasma cell. So if you had multiple myeloma, this would be the only cell that you would see. If you had lymphoma, this would be the only cell you could see. But look at what this cell doesn't have. It doesn't have CD20. So the target of rituxan is not on this cell. So now you begin to see that if you're going to be using a drug like rituxan, you're going to get part of the clone, but you're going to end up missing, you know, another part. And if you want to guess where IgM is made, uh, it's largely in this plasma cell. So if you have some problem attached to the IgM, this is the cell that you really want to go after. And as a result, you know, just using a drug like rituximab alone may not get you there. And so that's really important to keep in mind. Now, this is actually framing the state of the art. These are all the drugs and drug combinations that we use with rituximab. If we use rituximab alone, we usually get responses somewhere between 25 and 40 percent of patients, but that second column here shows you the complete remission response rate. And what you're seeing there is zero to five percent. And what you're also seeing right next to it is the time that we're able to control the disease just with rituxan alone. And that's somewhere between 13 months outwards to 22 months based on the published literature. So it tells us that, you know, we're not really getting deep or very sustained responses in most patients. 
And this is why the field over the last 20 years has tried to build on rituxan as a backbone. And this is not unique to Waldenstrom's. We've done the same thing with all the other B cell malignancies uh, with, uh, I think, varying uh, degrees of success. And so a lot of the drugs that we've combined rituximab were meant to not only help hit those B cells even harder, but go after those plasma cells that the rituxan doesn't touch. And that's why some of the more popular regimens that you see down here, the proteasome inhibitors, that would be like a drug like Velcade, Bortizomib, or Carfilzomib, as well as Bendamustine, those are the drugs that have shown really the greatest promise in combining uh, with rituximab. And note here that the response rates that we've been able to get with these combinations have been up to 90%, but we're also seeing more complete remissions. But notice once again, you know, 5 to 20% of patients in a complete remission. I think everyone in this room would agree we can do better. And that's really the point of all this. And when you look at what that means, those deeper responses, you begin to see that that translates into being able to keep patients in a remission for a longer period of time. Now this slide here represented a study that I did back in uh, 2011. It was published in the British Journal of Hematology. And what it was meant to do was to capture all the patients that had been treated with rituxan-based therapy and to see how their response equated to how long you could keep those patients in remission. And when we looked at the stratification of these patients, what we saw here was exactly what we had predicted from all the other trials, that the deeper the remission, if you can get patients into complete remission, this especially was good in keeping the patients in the longest period of time in response, followed by what we call VGPR. This is very good partial response, which represents a 90% reduction in disease burden. And then you saw PR, which is partial response, it's 50%. MR, which is minor response, 25% decrease. You get the point that the deeper the remission, the longer it's going to last. And that's why when you try to make a cogent argument about getting patients into complete remissions, it translates into how long we can keep patients uh, in those remissions. But here and now it becomes perhaps the argument for why this isn't, you know, in and of itself the end all. And that is that we can certainly take a lot of chemotherapies and bundle them together and really hit our patients hard. But with this, you, as you would expect, comes sometimes some very important toxicity. And I won't go over this slide in great detail except to say that the toxicity that we fear the most is the one of secondary malignancies. And many of the drugs over the years that we've worked on, drugs like fludarabine, maybe to lesser extent a drug like bendamustine, uh, this has been one of the consequences. So we've learned from these lessons, one being avoidance, to try to avoid these drugs, particularly in younger patients. Now you may ask me, what is a younger patient? Anybody younger than the oncologist usually is younger. <laughs> and as we all get older, <laughs> that benefits everyone in this room. <laughs> especially if you have Bob Kyle as your oncologist. <laughs> so, so, so this policy of trying to avoid uh, these toxic drugs, even minimize them, and I think Mort Coleman, for me, was really one of my inspirations with the drug fludarabine. He taught us very early on, you can get away with four, you don't need to give six cycles of therapy. That was a very important lesson because we do see sustained activity with fludarabine if we give less. We do see even with bendamustine that if we give four cycles, we can do just as well as giving six cycles. And as a result, with this, we're being able to reduce the risk of these secondary cancers. But there are also other problems associated with many of these drugs. You know, with bortezomib or Velcade, we see um, these neuropathies. Sometimes these neuropathies are reversible, sometimes they're not. Uh, even a drug like rituxan can actually erode away at the immune system. And uh, over time, the patients can have recurring sinus and bronchial infections. So you see here that just merely trying to put things together and throw them at the patient in hopes of getting a complete remission isn't necessarily going to get us to the end line if we're creating other problems along the way. And that's why it's important to keep in mind that these debates are genuine uh, and we still need answers for them. Now, a very pivotal moment in the history of Waldenstrom's was the discovery of the mid-88 mutation. 
Uh, this is a mutation which you've heard from Dr. Hunter and others here uh, is present in 93 to 97 percent uh, of all patients with Waldenstrom's. We have to give great credit to both the IWMF as well as to Peter being a physician uh, who made the funding possible for this study. This was done at a time that whole genome sequencing was still a very, very young art. Today it's like, you know, it's become kind of uh, routine. Uh, but in its time, it wasn't just the challenge and the enormous expense of doing whole genome sequencing, but it also had to do with the informatics, having the right team set up so you can actually be able to decode all this information. And keep in mind that every cell has three billion DNA molecules. And in order to be able to map out the mistake, you also need to take a normal cell from that person, so another three billion you know, DNA molecules, and then you match them up. And you try to proofread and see where the mistake is. And if you think about the MIDDA mutation, that's one mistake out of three billion DNA molecules. It's literally looking uh, for a needle in a haystack. And I have to give great credit to, you know, both our informational, computational information group at the Dana-Farber, as well as the genius of uh, Zachary Hunter that made all this uh, possible. Now, you may ask, well, what does this mutation do? Well, the first thing when you discover a mutation is to see whether or not it's truly functionable. And then if you decide that it is functionable, then the next thing is to see if it's actionable, meaning can I do something about it? And this was a very important uh, slide which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a paper that actually followed uh, the work of Lou Stout that had also found this mutation in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma in about 29% of those patients. And we all came to the same conclusion, and that is that when you have this mutation, it turns on this signaling for this survival pathway called NF-kappa B. Now, anyone in the cancer business would, the moment they hear that NF-kappa B is turned on, know right away that this is not a good thing because this is a very powerful signal that turns on the growth and survival of these cells. And it may be a little bit hard to look at, but these little blue entities that you're seeing are all the nuclei of Waldenstrom cells. And inside those, you see the little green lights that are turned on. That's actually NF-kappa B in the nucleus turning on all the machinery so that cell can grow. And right next to what you see is those same cells now being exposed to a mediated inhibitor. And you see, in fact, that the lights have been turned off and these cells are actually dying. And that's what we've been trying to do all along here with the help of the IWMF and the LLS to be able to chart out this pathway. How, how are these lights turned on? What are the switches? And how can we actually disable those? And that's really where a lot of our success in being able to create the next generation of drugs has come from. Let me actually just show you what some of this entails. And this story is getting complicated by the minute, and that's good. We want complication because it just tells us about more targets. But the first paper that came out came out because of this, the hard work of this gentleman here, Guang Yang. He actually began to look at the pathway. And what he found was that normally this is a pathway that bacteria and viruses trigger that actually turns on the mediated molecule. So you need these viruses and bacteria to be able to stimulate these immune cells to grow in the normal sense. But if you acquire the mutation, the switch is turned on and it's broken. You no longer need a stimulation from the outside. Internally, uh, the switch has been turned on. And the thing that he discovered was that Bruton's tyrosine kinase, this is the target of ibrutinib, and you'll be hearing about other drugs like acalabrutinib and zanubrutinib target this drug. Uh, target this, uh, this uh, molecule, this becomes part of the mediated complex. And when it's actually brought into the complex, it's able to turn on NF-kappa B. And that is what Dr. Yang was able to show us. And that became really the pivotal moment of identifying our first drug, which was ibrutinib, uh, as, a, uh, as a way of being able to silence this pathway. And along the lines, actually, we learned another very important lesson because of Zachary Hunter, but also because of Maria Luisa uh, Guerrera here, who was on loan to us from the University of Pavia. And they made a very interesting observation, and that is that when you have a mutation in a molecule like MID88, 
It turns on the signaling. But normally every cell has a break for all these signals. You can imagine that, you know, the minute you turn on a switch, you know, you're in trouble. And that's what usually happens in all of our immune cells. But you also have things that come in and shut things down. And the problem was, as they discovered, that because of other mutations, other losses, particularly in chromosome six, six that these uh, brakes were taken out. So now you have a car with the accelerator fully pressed down and somebody just yanked all the brakes. And in fact, if you look at some of these um, molecules, like the inhibitor of BTK, it's missing in about 60 to 70% of patients with Waldenstrom. If you look at some of these downstream uh, protein inhibitors um, that include these molecules, HIV, B2, and TNF, AIP3, they're also found in the same neighborhood uh, of chromosome six they're missing in another 60 to 70% of patients. So these breaks have been yanked out. Now just when you think, you know, you've got the whole story here, Dr. Yang calls you into his office and says, you know what, I made another very interesting observation. And this actually is a very interesting observation because it opens up even more opportunities for treatments but at the same time, it also tells us about why other signaling pathways are also turned on in Waldenstrom. And so what he discovered and published in the journal Blood is that when you have the mutated mid-88 molecule, it turns on this other behemoth. This is called HCK, and this is something we should all become familiar with because the IWMF as well as the LLS has provided funding to create drugs to shut down HCK. Now what HCK does is normally it shouldn't be there in Waldenstrom cells. These, this is a molecule that's normally expressed in very early B cells. We're dealing with late B cells when we think about Waldenstrom, so it has no business being there. But it's the mutated mid-88 that's brought it up. It's, it's revived it, and it's a troublemaker. And what this troublemaker does is, it actually is what turns on BTK, but it also turns on these other pathways, like ERK, as well as AKT. We're gonna talk a lot more about ERK, but these are also growth and survival pathways. And they help explain why many before us, you know, like Irene Gobriel and Xavier Lelou and others, had found that these pathways were turned on, but they had no explanation. And what Dr. Yang, you know, showed us is in fact that it's HCK being brought back to life that's turning on these other very important pathways. Now you may say, well, what does that mean to me as a patient? Well, this is interesting because Ibrutinib not only goes after BTK, but it's also able to target HCK and shut it down. And so this is why we began to now begin to theorize, you know, that ibrutinib was gonna be a very active drug in the treatment of Waldenstrom's and of course other BTK inhibitors, like I mentioned, were to follow. Now, Dr. Hunter uh, spoke to you about CXCR4 mutations. Uh, we should give him complete credit for the discovery uh, of this mutation. When we did our original whole genome screen, you know, through, you know, our, our um, informatics group and through Dr. Hunter, um, this was missed. And because of his informatic prowess, his ability to go back and create whole new programs to be able to look for other mutations from the whole genome project, he was able to make this discovery. And why we should really be excited is because these are relatively unique to Waldenstrom's and they're found in up to 40% of Waldenstrom's patients. There are patients who are born with defects very similar to this, but in no other cancer do you see that these uh, molecules are expressed the way they are in Waldenstrom's. Now you may say, well, what does this mean you know, to me? Well, first of all, there are a lot of these mutations, uh, and they're all clustered right here. This is a little pigtail uh, for the uh, protein. Normally, this is a receptor, and it signals, and I'll show you that in a second, but just keep in mind that all these mutations are clustered in this little pigtail. And what was discovered because of work that was done in our laboratory as well as in Dr. Um, Gobriel's laboratory was that there's this molecule called CXCL12 that's, turned, that's secreted by the bone marrow itself, and it actually binds to CXCR4, CXCR4 being a receptor on the cell surface. And when you have the mutation, uh, this um, antenna stays on and it's able to continuously signal and turn on all these pathways. And the consequences of which are, 
that they can actually make the cell resistant to many drugs, including uh, the drug ibrutinib. And so it was really important to be able to understand the context of this um, mutation to see its function, and then we'll talk a little bit about action uh, that potentially can be taken against this uh, mutation. Now with this all in mind, we were very eager to test ibrutinib in patients with relapsed and refractory Waldenstrom's disease. I want to give credit to Dr. Advani as well as Dr. Palumba, Advani at Stanford and Palumba at Memorial Sloan uh, for helping to get this study off the ground. And as part of the study, the patients got 420 milligrams a day of ibrutinib and they could stay on the drug. Um, and as part of the um, uh, study, they also had their MIDI-D8 and CXCR4 uh, mutation status uh, checked. Now, the genomic data, the signaling data, the functional data, as well as the early data of the trial, uh, and then the whole trial being, um, you know, uh, mature enough, this allowed us to get the first ever breakthrough designation by the FDA uh, for a fast track approval. First ever in oncology, if you think about that. There's another first, you know, <laughs> that we should talk about. <laughs> But, but where you really want the applause is the first drug approval ever for Waldenstrom's macroglobulin. <laughs> and so this is a home run, if you think about it. You know, there isn't any cancer researcher out there who would not like to discover something in the genome, do the modeling in the laboratory, take it to the patients in a clinical trial, and ultimately get a drug approval. And why I think this is a very important story, and one that, you know, we tell all our colleagues all over the world, is that because it's within each one of us as cancer investigators to do this. We don't need large companies to be able to come to us and say, I've got a clinical trial for you. We can actually do the discovery. And that's what, Carl, you were able to do for this field. You've been able to enable, because of all the funding, this kind of, you know, uh, discovery from the ground up. And this success story, you should all be, you and whoever else is listening, you know, out there across the world, should be extremely proud, because this is just the first chapter of many that I think are going to be written uh, because of everything that we learned from the whole genome. Now, I want to update you a little bit with the trial results. Uh, the final uh, summary of these uh, results is going to be presented um, at the International Conference on Malignant Lymphoma in just two weeks' time. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little glimpse about what we've learned up to now. And of course, that data will be presented for the first time uh, in Lugano in Switzerland uh, at that meeting. So initially when the study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, we only had about 19 months average follow-up uh, for all the patients. Uh, the data that we reported subsequent to that was 47 months, so almost four years follow-up, and the last patient follow-up was in October of this past year. Now if you look here, the overall response rate, that means any of those response categories that I showed you earlier was 91%. 78% of the patients had what we call a major response, at least a partial 50% reduction. And VGPR, which is very good partial response, was 29%. What you don't see here is, again, complete response, okay? And that's really the sobering part of this data. But on the other hand, what you also see, which I think is a very important learning curve, is how the mutations made a difference. If you had no mid-88 mutation, you really didn't get deep responses. If you did have a mid-88 mutation plus CXCR4, you were double mutated, you see, in fact, the deeper responses were elusive. You know, we only saw 10% of the VGPRs if you had both mutations, 44% if you only had the mid-88 mutation. And it took you longer to get there. It took you six months if you had the CXCR4 mutation. It took you only two months if you didn't. So this begins to frame to us why the genomics is so important. So when many of you ask the question, you know, should I be getting this, you know, mutation uh, screen done, this is where it can be factored in uh, to clinical decision making. Now this is also a very important slide because it shows you how patients fared on this uh, study over time. So at five years after commencing therapy, 60% of all the patients are still in a remission. 
And that's really important to keep in mind because these were all heavily pretreated patients. Some people had up to nine prior therapies before coming on this study. And when one thinks about you know, what comes after number nine, there's really not, not much. But yet those patients uh, you know, also benefited um, by the brutinib. But you, what you also see now is the breakdown of how long patients remained in a remission. Um, if you had only the mid-88 mutation, three quarters, 75% of those patients are still in a remission at five years. If you had both, it's somewhere around 50 months, which is still extraordinary when you think about all the other therapeutics, the benchmarks that we compare to. And if you had no mid-88 mutation, you know, the disease progressed very quickly. We also learned the same thing from our frontline study. We did a study in patients that had not been treated previously that were receiving uh, ibrutinib for the first time. There's my colleague, Jorge Castillo, who has been navigating this study. It was published as the JCO editor's pick. I just want you to hear that. Uh, this is the top oncology journal uh, in the world, and yet Waldenstrom's was the editor's pick for that particular uh, issue. Uh, and that was because not only of the activity with ibrutinib, but the genomic data. And it was almost a copy of what we had learned from the previously treated uh, patients, that if you had both mutations, you didn't get those deep responses and it took longer to get there. Now, one very important study that was an outcome of the uh, BTK um, discovery was the Innovate study. In fact, I do know in this room that we have uh, some Innovate participants. This was a very large randomized study, 150 patients who took part in the study, 45 centers in nine countries. And the objective of this study was to see how patients did if they got ibrutinib plus rituxan versus what had been deemed the community standard of rituxan alone. The data that I want to show you here is very interesting because what we learned in those studies with ibrutinib alone came to be that if you had both mutations, that those deep responses were less, you see 73% versus 94% if you had only the mid-88 mutation. And with this, if you look at once again how long those responses lasted, what do you see here? You see in fact that those individuals that had the CHCR4 mutation progressed earlier. So once again, very much in line, despite this being a very large clinical trial, uh, seeing the same observation. So you see where now CXCR4 itself has also a role in preventing us from getting at those complete responses and keeping patients even in deep responses. Now, can we do something about it? We talked about function. Now it's time for action. And I will tell you that the results of this particular trial are very, very promising, and they actually help validate that we can go after CXCR4. This is a trial using the drug Ulocuplumab. It took me a long time to be able to learn how to pronounce it. And I think Jorge Castillo did it very nicely with his uh, Latin American accent, so I started taking after him. But ulocuplumab is an antibody that actually binds to CXCR4, and it prevents that CXCL12 that's released from the bone marrow from engaging its receptor. So you can actually turn off CXCR4 with this antibody. This has been a phase one study where we're giving you know, lower dose of the drug, and then we're going up with time. And uh, we are now into cohort three. We've done well with cohort one. We've, done, we've gotten through cohort two well. Now we're into cohort three. And the patients are getting six months of the drug. And what we're seeing is very rapidly, they're getting into those deep remissions. We're not waiting now six or seven months. And we're also seeing that those remissions are deeper. Now there is a successor to this drug uh, which is an oral inhibitor, uh, X4 is the uh, company that's making it. We're very excited that they're actually looking at Waldenstrom's as a disease where they want to be able to bring their oral inhibitor against CXCR4 uh, into a clinical trial. So I think as far as you know, the news to share with you, which is really very important news, we now have a second actionable mutation in Waldenstrom's. And I think this is going to be a very, very uh, exciting area for further discovery, and maybe really, you know, in a few years' time, once we have all that data, uh, to uh, change our standard of care. Now, the next slide shows that we're going to get even more complicated, because it shows you that Dr. Yang in the laboratory can be very dangerous. You know, <laughs> he, can, 
he can find more problems. <laughs> but at the same time, what Dr. Yang is able to do that very few other people do, uh, he can also find solutions. And with his um, you know, um, graduate student here, uh, Dr. Manit Munshi, uh, they've been able to now discover that mediate also causes one more thing uh, to be turned on, and that's this molecule called Seq. For many years now, work that was done largely at Memorial Sloan by Leah Palumbo, we knew that this other pathway was turned on in Waldenstrom's, but we really didn't know what was causing it. And that's what actually stimulated Dr. Yang to look you know, for additional con contributors to mid-88 signaling. This here pathway, called the BCR pathway, uh, is turned on in patients with Waldenstrom. And it's because mid-88 is able to turn on this molecule seek that that occurs. Now look what happens downstream. You, hear, you see the molecule STAT3. Many years ago, Dr. Ansel told us that STAT3 was actually turned on in Waldenstrom's, but we didn't know why. We also knew that the molecule AKT was turned on for reasons that I mentioned earlier because of work by Irene Gobriel and Xavier Lelou. Again, not knowing why. But now we do. We understand that mid-88 is able to turn on this very important pathway. And you may ask now, well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that if you're treating somebody with ibrutinib and you're able to block you know, parts of the pathway, you still have a signaling pathway that still remains on that keeps those cells alive and well. And that's where, once again, I think the fortitude of the IWMF and the LLS have played a very important role. Because one of the drugs that they've helped us develop, which is this drug called KIN8194, not only is able to inhibit HCK and BTK, but it also takes out the molecule that turns on Seq in the downstream pathway. And this is very exciting because this molecule continues to advance, and I hope one day very, very soon will complete its toxicology and be able to get into the clinic. But we're very excited about this molecule. And again, if you want to think about what happens with the grant money that you provide us with, this is it. We're able to bring together lots of very bright people with different levels of expertise. In this case, it was bringing together the Harvard Medicinal Chemistry Group, giving them the targets, and letting them work with our group to be able to develop these drugs. Now, I'm going to tell you about another very important uh, problem in Waldenstrom's, and it has to do with this molecule called BCL2. I think Dr. Hunter had already talked about this. I know Dr. Castillo also mentioned this to you. Um, but fundamentally, whenever you're dealing with these type of cells, B cells, you may be able to kick them really hard, but they won't die because they have internal programming that turns on that prevents them from turning on the switches of self-destruct. And BCL2 is one of those very, very important molecules. It's very highly expressed, especially in people that have the mid-88 mutation. As a result, you can kick very hard, uh, but you're not going to get these cells to die. And as a result, you know, what we have been trying to do uh, is to be able to stop you know, BCL2 in order to get these cells to die. Now, if you need an example, um, it's like going to a very aggressive soccer game where you've got the ibrutinib team or Zanya Brutinib or Acalib Brutinib, all trying to score. Uh, and what you have is the goalie there, you know, representing BCL2 that's trying to block that from happening. I, for my Canadian friends, I would have put a hockey game in here, but I know how, you know, um, on the edge we are these days with the Bruins uh, in on this, so I, I figured we would just limit it to a soccer game this time. <laughs> but this really frames the problem you know, that if we're going to make any um, strides, we need to take out BCL2. Now, very early on, before many people even had heard about the drug Venetoclax, uh, Dr. Yang Kao in our laboratory was already working with this molecule, and she made a very interesting discovery. She used cell lines that were both CXCR4 normal and CXCR4 mutated. And what she showed here was that if she added a brutinib, she got a little whiff of death. You know, she measured these uh, bands here, which are bands that predict that the cell is undergoing apoptosis or cell death. She added in the drug ABT199. That's actually the drug venetoclax. The same thing. She saw a little whiff of, you know, cell killing. Uh, and then she added both drugs together. And you can see how potently uh, 
uh, the cell death mechanism was induced. And this was the same whether or not she was dealing with CXCR4 normal or CXCR4 mutated cells. And along comes another very important hero of mine, uh, Jorge Castillo, and runs this very important trial now looking at the activity of venetoclax uh, in Waldenstrom's patients that had already uh, been treated. And this was a very important trial because it taught us that venetoclax was active uh, in previously treated Waldenstrom's patients, regardless of whether they had had ibrutinib before or uh, their CXCR4 mutation status. But again, if you look at those deep responses, it was better if you hadn't seen ibrutinib. It was better if you had not the, um, the CXCR4 mutation. Now, what I think is going to turn out to be probably one of the most exciting trials uh, going ahead is this combination study of ibrutinib and venetoclax because if, if it's true to what we've seen in culture, in, you know, in our preclinical studies, uh, this you know, study will have perhaps the greatest ability to deliver on those deeper responses and hopefully some of them uh, ultimately leading to eradication of disease. So in the next uh, couple of slides, I want to show you some of the most exciting work that's going on uh, at the Bing Center. And it speaks to another very important problem, and that is drug resistance. Ibrutinib has been a very successful drug, but whether it's you know, using it in Waldenstrom's, using it in CLL, mantle cell lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, even the aggressive lymphomas, we're starting to see resistance. And this occurs uh, for some patients within a few years' time, for some perhaps later on. And this has to do with this mutation in Bruton's tyrosine kinase itself. So the mutation occurs where the ibrutinib is supposed to bind to BTK. And as a result, ibrutinib no longer can bind and inactivate uh, this very, very critical uh, protein. And in some patients, as, Dr., as uh, Leanne Zhu in our group showed, some patients can actually have multiple different types of BTK mutations. So it shows you that this is a very important pathway and that when you know, these cells break through, they break through on different fronts. Uh, most of these patients also tend to be people that have the CXCR4 mutation. And reasons why we see this as an underlying generator of these mutations uh, remains to be seen. Now, in our laboratory, we've had the great fortune of having this uh, mother and son team, the Chens, you can see the resemblance there, uh, working very diligently uh, on trying to understand what these mutations do. And this is actually a first for the entire field because very few people have cell lines like we do in Waldenstrom's. There are no cell lines in CLL. We have them in Waldenstrom's. So we're actually able to put these mutations into the cells and then study what they do. And what we found was they actually turn on this pathway ERK. Didn't we talk about ERK earlier? And ERK itself gets turned on because of the mutation. And as a result, it's able to keep these cells alive and you know, unable to be killed because of ibrutinib. Now what these cells also do is they start corrupting all the good cells around them. It's almost as if you've got now one spoiled apple now you know, ruining the whole bushel. And that's what these cells are doing. And as a result, we've been focused on ways to be able to get rid of this very bad apple. So let me show you the experiment that actually got a lot of notoriety funded by the IWMF. This was an experiment where on one side of this culture dish, we put the bad apples or we put the good apples. And then we wanted to see what happened on the other side in the presence of ibrutinib. And what happened is that if you had good cells uh, on one side, um, no mutation, and you added ibrutinib, they all died. But if you had the bad apple that represented in red there, uh, and you put them on one side, they also made the so cells on the other side that didn't have the mutation resistant. And that's because all these cytokines, these proteins, were getting through the membrane, and they were causing those cells to resist ibrutinib. And as a result, you know, these cells were able to uh, live and uh, expand. Now, we have actually a drug made against ERK. This is, again, the pathway that's turned on. And thanks to, once again, your support, we've been able to leverage the knowledge of this new drug, uh, this ERK inhibitor, that we're now going to be using in patients who have developed the ibrutinib uh, resistance gene and are progressing. And rather than take these patients off ibrutinib, which often comes with many consequences, 
the, um, the intent here is to add the ERK inhibitor to be able to silence out all these uh, bad cells in hopes of being able to continue the ibrutinib function. And I think this is going to be a very important trial. It's not just Waldenstrom's. We'll be seeing about its effect in other um, diseases that benefit also by ibrutinib. Now, on the horizon, I want you to get excited about these other BTK inhibitors. There's a drug called acalabrutinib. It's also shown a lot of activity, very similar to ibrutinib, but also uh, the drug zanubrutinib, which is also showing very high levels of response in patients with Waldenstrom's. And what I think we should all get excited about is whenever we see a phase three study, where we're now trying to compare you know, one drug against the other, and in this case, this is a study comparing zanubrutinib against ibrutinib in Waldenstrom's patients. Uh, this is a trial that's already been fully enrolled and you know, has involved a lot of investigators across many, many countries. And this really shows you that when you get a field going, um, you can really start bringing a lot of very new and exciting drugs. Now, the real challenge coming out of our workshops, out of our roadmap meetings, is that we now have a lot of partners that we can use to be able to eradicate residual or resistant disease. And you can see here that it's not just limited to therapies that we can give to patients in combination with ibrutinib, but also involves other immunotherapies uh, that can be used to help get rid of these uh, residual resistant cells. And it's really being able to incorporate all these novel therapies that really represents all the excitement uh, for the next chapter in Waldenstrom's. In the last couple of slides, I just also want to touch bases on a few other areas that are very important um, that we should all be thinking about. Not everyone has the mid-88 mutation. Uh, there is approximately you know, anywhere between 3 and 10 percent of patients who don't. Um, and this is a very important unmet need because these patients don't benefit with ibrutinib and even other therapeutics that we have seen, such as the recent bendamustine trial by the French, also show that these are the patients that fall out you know, very, very early. Now, what does this mean in terms of you know, outcome? This is actually a survival curve. Now, normally, I don't show survival curves, you know, particularly at a meeting like this. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to show you a survival curve. Because the first piece of good news that I want to show you on the survival curve, this came from the Bing Center patient population is that when you look at average overall survival in those patients that have the mid-88 mutation, regardless of CXCR4, it's over 18 years now. So think about where we were and where we are now and where we're going, more importantly. But I want you to also see that in this um, chart, these are the patients that don't have the mid-88 mutation. And this is why we still have to focus very importantly on this population. And one of the reasons why these patients don't do as well is because they tend to transform to more aggressive lymphomas. This was based on a study we did as well as our colleagues at the Mayo calling out that these patients actually have a higher risk of transforming to a more aggressive lymphoma. So at our group, uh, Zach Hunter has been very focused along with his group to try to identify the mutations that underlie the driver of this particular disease. We actually were able to identify very important uh, mutations, including some highly recurrent ones, and even ones that I think we're going to get, you know, to be able to make targeted therapies. But in this gene list were also genes that also are found in aggressive lymphomas. So right away we knew why we had this transformation problem. We also were able to model this in existing signaling cascades that we knew to also understand that most of these mutations that drive this disease are below BTK. So as a result, even if you give the ibrutinib, these things are under uh, you know, the BTK uh, protein, and as a result, that's why we're not seeing the benefit. And so this is really, I think, a very important challenge, uh, Carl, as we go ahead, and Tom, uh, to be able to try to better understand and target this uh, you know, imp uh, patient population. Now, you've heard about MID-88, you've heard about CXCR4, many of you are going to go to bed tonight thinking these are the only two things I need to worry about. Not true. <laughs> or at least you may not worry about them, I have to tomorrow. <laughs> so are there other mutations? The answer is yes. And some of these other mutations actually based on our very short, you know, small whole genome sequencing effort, 
you know, we're still coming out between 5 and 20 percent. So there's these, all these other mutations we do need to worry about. And why we need to worry about them is because they potentially give us also actionable mutations. In fact, some of them uh, on this list are things that we actually can have drugs already, you know, on the shelf today that we can actually take to the clinic and start looking at. So with your help from the IWMF, you've helped us fund the 300 project. This is a very interesting project, and it's almost on the same scale as any other large lymphoma sequencing uh, that has been done. In fact, when you see the two papers by Dr. Stout's group at the NIH, and you look at Dr. Ship's group uh, from the Dana-Farber on aggressive lymphomas, the largest ever sequencing effort, there were only 300 patients. And here we are now with a far less common Waldenstrom's, uh, and we're there as well. And what this project is really meant to do is to look at Waldenstrom's almost like layers of cake, you know, looking at the DNA, RNA, and everything else on top of that that helps regulate uh, the DNA. And this is going to give us a very comprehensive atlas. So if we're ever going to dream about personalized medicine approach, this is the project that I think is really going to help us the most because then we'll be able to chart a course that has to do with every individual's own genomic problems. Now, before you get too excited, also think about one other problem, and that is these genomic mistakes are also a moving target. And our myeloma colleagues have taught us this because they've had a little bit of advance, you know, on us, because they've also seen that when they expose patients to certain drugs, their disease and their mutations also evolve over time. And this, too, turned out to be one of the important things at the roadmap meeting that we really need to invest in to try to see what happens to the evolution of these clones over time with different therapeutics. Now, Tom already let out the cat on the, you know, out of the bag on this one, and that is, do you want us to be able to find MID-88 in a much easier way than bone marrow biopsies? <laughs> you gotta be louder. <laughs> I, I want everyone outside of here to hear you. <laughs> This is really important because if we're going to do any type of personalized medicine, we've got to get it right. You know, a lot of these testing platforms that we use can miss the mid-88, you know, mutation. And you've got now clinical trials that are reporting activity, you know, in patients that don't have the mid-88 mutation, as an example. And you have to ask, you know, is this real? Because there are fundamental problems. One is that if you're relying on the peripheral blood to be able to check for the mutation, it works. But you've got to do it when the patient hasn't seen any therapy. If they have, uh, it's going to be hard. The other is the platform that you're using. You know, if you're relying on what most people in most clinical diagnostic laboratories do, which is this next generation type of sequencing, uh, you can miss, you know, up to 30% of patients compared to the gold standard of PCR. And so as a result, there's a lot of real interest. Dr. Drandi has uh, published just very recently a very nice paper from Italy on the use of cell-free DNA, where you just take the DNA out of the blood and check for it. And this has the ability of capturing mid-88 no matter where it is, whether it's in the bone marrow and lymph nodes. And so as a result, I really do think this is gonna be a very important area for us to fund uh, because mid-88 is so critical. And I think also CXCR4 testing will also be a great beneficiary. And when it comes to CXCR4, the actual mutations that we care about, what we call the nonsense mutations, Dr. Castillo published a very nice paper uh, having to do with these mutations, uh, these nonsense mutations that can be easily picked up, you know, on these screens as being the ones that we should care about the most when it comes to thinking about, you know, the use of ibrutinib. And that's why, once again, these represent actionable mutations that we ought to, you know, get to know more about. And coming to a conclusion here, I just want to talk about two other areas that I think we all need to care more about, and that is first the patients with Big Nail Syndrome. Uh, we all acknowledge that this represents a very severe morbidity, and up to very recent times, you know, we've been kind of going at this very much ad hoc. We do know because of some limited data that ibrutinib, particularly at higher doses, may be effective. But also, as you can see, there are other drugs, but we have no prospective trials. And that's something that I really urge the field, you know, to look at. We need to be able to uh, 
you know, as advocates in this room to be able to advocate for these trials because these are patients uh, that need our help. And this goes to show you in this slide that we can make a difference. This is a patient that had probably one of the worst cases of Bing-Neal syndrome who got high dose ibrutinib and just a few months later, uh, you know, his disease had cleared out. And simultaneously, this patient had the drug levels of ibrutinib checked in both his uh, CSF that circulates in the brain as well as his blood to show, in fact, that the drug was getting through. So this is why these kind of trials are very, very important. And peripheral neuropathy. I'm sure there are people in this room that are here because of peripheral neuropathy. Again, we've had no dedicated trial uh, against uh, peripheral neuropathy in Waldenstrom's, despite the fact that almost a quarter of all patients uh, come in because of peripheral neuropathy. And that's a very important area because all the existing modalities that we use are not really um, doing anything more than slowing things down. Uh, they're not getting us to resolution of these neuropathies. And so as a result, as Dr. Nobila Razio's study showed us, if we're not able to control neuropathy over time, patients can become disabled. And so this is why drugs like ibrutinib that have shown activity against peripheral neuropathy, you know, need to now be tested in a prospective manner for us to be able to find, you know, new and um, validated ways of treating uh, this particular morbidity. I just want to close here by showing you a couple of pictures from the international workshop. Uh, this is actually one of the sessions, again, 350 um, investigators representing 35 countries. It was wonderful to see everybody coming together in New York to talk about all this subject matter that we just kind of went over today over the three and a half days time. And at the meeting we honored Dr. Giampaolo Merlini <clears throat> with the Robert A. Kyle Award uh, as well as Bart Barlogi with the Jan Waldenstrom uh, Award. These are both individuals that have made tremendous contributions uh, to our field. And of course, we had the opportunity to also honor uh, four humanitarians at a ceremony that took place at the United Nations. And uh, these were people that I think many of you already know. Uh, it includes um, uh, Mort Coleman, who's here with us. In fact, we have three of these individuals here today, <clears throat> honoring them for all their humanitarian efforts in Waldenstrom's. Carl Harrington, who I know all of you know. <laughs> Chris Patterson, <laughs> and of course somebody that we all need to acknowledge as well, and that's uh, Ranjana Advani, who actually ran the first ibrutinib trial uh, that included Waldenstrom's patients. <laughs> and the last actually is my favorite, and this is really the hope that we have for the future. These are all the young investigators, uh, 20 of them, that we were able to honor. These were all individuals who submitted their scientific work and abstracts and they were chosen um, to be acknowledged with their awards and this took place on Ellis Island. And I think if, you know, if there's one thing to talk about here and get excited about is the legacy that we're now imparting for this disease, not only attracting people from all over the world but creating a whole new generation to keep fighting. Thank you so much for your kind attention and let's keep up the good work. Thank you, Dr. Tran. That was just outstanding. What we're going to do now is uh, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. And rather than run them around, do you think you can make your way up here if you've got questions? We'll have Sue over here and, and Michael over there with a microphone. And if you can wind your way through the tables, it will be faster, I think. So come on up with your questions, and Dr. Tran will answer as many as he can. Really interesting presentation, thank you. My question is, how important is it today for my doctor to understand which mutations I have in governing my treatment today? No, that's a good question, and it comes back to what I was uh, just answering this gentleman. I think we should get the mutations. They will help us make informed decisions about best use of therapeutics. And you've got now this class of drugs, you know, represented by ibrutinib that are very much you know, dependent on the mid-88 and CXCR4 mutation.
And if, you're, if your doctor has that information, they can kind of leverage how these drugs, you know, how they should fit into your particular care. Um, and it's not just, you know, upfront. It's not going to be something that your doctor is going to think about just the first day they meet you, if this is the first time you're being treated. But it's going to be something that's going to follow you. Because no matter what your treatment is, at some point you're going to see one of these BTK inhibitors and how you leverage them will be very much dependent on you know, that, you know, those mutations. And let me also just leave you with one thought. It's not just about ibrutinib. As more trials are coming around, we're learning about how CXCR4 is able to affect other drugs. Like for instance, in the trial that Dr. Castillo did using the drug exazomib, he found that if you had the CXCR4 mutation, it took longer to get into a response. Uh, we also know from the study that happened in France, where they looked at bendamustine and rituxan, the patients that progressed earliest were those that didn't have the MIDI-D8 or CXCR4 mutation. And so this also tells us a little bit about the urgency of needing to develop better therapeutics. So I think as of today, knowing what one's MIDI-D8 and CXCR4 mutation status is can really help tremendously in our ability to rationally figure out what therapeutic approach is needed today as well as what we should plan on for tomorrow. Thank you. And you mentioned that specifically with relation to ibrutinib. Would, would that apply as well to bendamustine? I, I think I heard the mention of that earlier. Yeah. So, you know, what we know as of today is that bendamustine-based therapy is affected by the mid 8 status based on that one prospective trial, uh, CXCR4 did not you know, impact how those patients did um, in, in the Philo trial that was published just recently. So it's, so it's mid-88, not CXCR4. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Dr. Trion. Um, there seems to be a lot of second-generation ibrutinibs or BTK inhibitors coming out. We heard from uh, Dr. Castillo about the umbralizib, then you were talking about the xanabrutinib, and I saw a bunch of others that I don't even remember. Are there any that are like the most exciting or most targeted or might have the least side effects that you think? Well, let me, let me start with uh, the question I don't know if everybody heard was, you know, we've got all these new BTK inhibitors uh, coming. Are any of them showing, you know, any uh, particular promise? And are any of them more targeted? Uh, the first thing just to tell you is that being more targeted isn't necessarily a good thing. Because as we learned from a early BTK inhibitor, it was a drug that uh, cell gene and prior to that Avila had created. Uh, it was too clean. It only went after BTK. So it wasn't promiscuous. It only went after that one target. Now this is an example where being promiscuous is actually a good thing. <laughs> and in the case of this particular you know, example with ibrutinib, it, only, it not only hit BTK, but it also hit HCK. And what you've got to also remember is that that's just, you know, the icing on the cake. These uh, drugs all have multiple targets. And as we've been deciphering out what their activity is, those targets can be within the cell, things like HCK and others, but they can also be in the environment. And that's a very important lesson because what drives Waldenstrom's has to also do with the microenvironment, what, you know, what, the, what they're getting, what these cells are getting in the bone marrow. Uh, those cells include cells like mast cells. We've reported on this many times over. If you look at your bone marrow biopsies, many of you will see increased number of mast cells found in your bone marrow. Mast cells are usually the cells associated with allergy. And then we also have you know, macrophages, which are also cells in the bone marrow. And these cells are actually feeding the Waldenstrom cells with protein signals that allow them to grow and survive. And both BTK and HCK are present in those cells that we're able to shut down. So it's not only going after the internal machinery of the cell, but also silencing all the contributors to the growth and survival of the cells. And that's why we're gonna see differences in these kinase inhibitors. And ultimately, it's gonna take a randomized clinical trial like the one we see now for zanubrutinib and ibrutinib to be able to tell us what those uh, differences are. Now, there are also uh, logistical you know, differences. Ibrutinib is given once a day, zanubrutinib is given twice a day. You know, the latter may be perhaps you know, um, advantageous 
if you think about drug coverage. On the other hand, it also means somebody has to take the drug twice a day. So those are all the differences that you know, a randomized clinical trial will answer. And then there's side effects. You know, there may be very different side effect profiles you know, in time that we will see in these randomized trials, but so far, um, based on what we have seen from the phase two data, they all seem relatively comparable. Now, if you have somebody who has a side effect on ibrutinib, having these other drugs is also exciting because maybe you can switch them over instead of you know, abandoning BTK inhibitor therapy. So being able to leverage all these new drugs to us is a very exciting opportunity. Cool, thanks. Two, two questions. As I understand it, does zenobrutinib hit HCK? We don't know. We don't know. The uh, kinome profiles, you know, for these second generation um, BTK inhibitors is less uh, clear. So there's, a, there's no published kinome profile that I've been able I mean, to it, access. Those are easy assays. Yeah. Well, I, um, I, know. I know. But somebody has it, to do them though. But let's say it doesn't hit HCK. Just to suppose. I wonder if you could combine it with dasatinib to hit the to get the HCK activity. So um, potentially. Potentially, although we're doing now a dedicated trial with desatinib, and that's being um, you know, run by Dr. Castillo. And desatinib, as you know, is a very potent HCK inhibitor. That trial will actually teach us a lot about you know, the importance of HCK as a target, but also what we're trying to do in that trial is to look at ibrutinib-resistant patients. Um, since HCK turns on BTK, what we're actually hoping is that by shutting off HCK, we'll also be able to shut off BTK, even if it's mutated. Uh -huh. um, you know, combining these down the line, I think, you know, potentially has merits. One has to keep in mind that desatinib tends to have its own share of toxicities, but it does represent a potential way forward. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited that Hore uh, is doing this trial. We were able to finally get funding for it. You know, the company gave us the drug, but didn't give us the funding. So. Um, Dunkin' Donuts stepped in and uh, provided us one of its breakthrough grants. <laughs> so, so if you just happen to be around a Dunkin' Donuts, <laughs> I, I encourage you to, to be a user. <laughs> and the, the second real quick question is, yeah. I, I'm trying to think of things that you didn't talk about, which it's not a whole lot. You got 10, well, you got less than 10 minutes. <laughs> but <laughs> well, as long as you're doing all this sequencing, what about looking at CD16A for the polymorphisms to, to try to predict a rituxan response? You already, know, V versus F. Already done it, published it, and that was in 2005, I believe, or maybe even earlier than that. So we did look, and I don't know, just to bring everybody up to speed, there are polymorphisms uh, in our cells that determine how well we respond to, um, to uh, rituximab. And these are the receptors that actually the immune cells have that engage the rituximab. And we were pioneers. I have to say, give Waldenstrom's another round of applause because we were among the first to actually, you know, make this, uh, this discovery. And it was published also at the time in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. So, you know, that's a very exciting moment for Waldenstrom's. Um, the problem is that once um, you start combining chemotherapies, you can actually negate uh, the effects of, you know, these polymorphisms. And so as a result, you know, since most of the time we use the two drugs or three drugs together, um, that we're able to overcome the polymorphisms. But if you're using rituxan by itself, it certainly is a, um, you know, it, it's worth considering. There was a company that actually offered this um, and over time it went bust. I think it got even bought by, you know, one of the other um, molecular diagnostic laboratories and it really didn't have much more clinical utility. But that's what we're getting at with MIDI-D8 and CXCR4 that now with the current drugs that we have, the BTK inhibitors, being able to personalize, you know, our approach to treating patients is much like we tried to do with rituxan and the uh, FC gamma R3A uh, variants. Okay, thanks. All good questions. Give this gentleman a round of applause. That was, those were very good questions. <laughs> okay, last question from Pete. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. One quick question here. You suggested... It's never a I quick think, question with Pete. <laughs> <laughs> ...that ibrutinib evolved uh, mutations. 
I think that's what you said, rather than the mutations were pre-existing and they were shown to be there. Are you saying that ibrutinib and maybe venetoclax is mutagenic? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to run over my 10 minutes here, Pete. <laughs> As best as we can tell, these, uh, and I'm only going to talk about the brutinib related resistance um, mutations. As best as we can tell, these things are pre existing. And what happens is, as you put the selective pressure of a drug, these are the clones that are actually breaking through and growing. Um, now, it's hard to prove this other than through inference because these are like in the one to million, you know, clones. Uh, and we don't have the ability today to test out, you know, those kind of mutations at that frequency. But you're, you are seeing this happening across the board in all the diseases, and uh, we don't see it at, at, you know, before the patients start on therapy. And that's why we're all inferring that they exist and that the drugs are unlikely to be mutagenic. Yeah. Okay, give yourselves a round of applause. Great questions. Thank you very much.